Hi, my name is Emily Danforth, and I'm the author of The Miseducation of Cameron Post, which is a coming-of-gage novel set in the 90s in Montana. Uh, it's about a rural, kind of a cowgirl of a girl named Cameron Post, who's understanding that she's queer at exactly the same time that she's orphaned. Both of her parents have died. Um, and as she gets involved with her first girlfriend, her aunt finds out and sends her to a conversion therapy facility, and that's the second half of the book. I am loving being published in the UK. Uh, when I when I first sold the book in the United States, I actually heard from the, a lot of the folks on my team that the book would not translate well to foreign markets uh, because it's such an American story, they said, and too queer a story. Uh, and I'm not finding that with UK readers at all. People, there are many universal themes in the book and people absolutely relate to Cam, so it's been thrilling to be published here. I think I followed the classic advice of writing the novel that I wanted to read, and I had not read a book about a queer girl growing up in a rural place the way that I did, especially eastern Montana. Uh, and so I tried to write that book. I was also a big fan of the coming-of-age novel and the orphan narrative. Uh, and when I finished, I'd given it to enough other readers who said, we think there's a readership for this, and happened to meet my agent at a conference, and she'd heard a little bit about the book, and even though I did the worst job in history of pitching it to her, Thankfully, other people had, had said better things about the book, and she asked to see part of it, and, and the rest is, is history for Cam. I did not set out to write a book on conversion therapy, um, and I did not know when I started writing this book in 2005 that sadly conversion therapy would be as relevant, um, horrifyingly relevant a topic as it is in 2018, and that we'd still be talking about it on both a U.S. scale and an international level. Uh, I set out to write a book about a queer girl figuring out that she's queer in an environment that does not support her, both because the town is so small and because it was set in the early 1990s and queer culture obviously had not infiltrated the larger culture in the way that it has today. As I was writing the book and drawing from my own experiences growing up in a place that did not accept me and did not understand my queerness, uh, I became more and more aware of conversion therapy for a variety of reasons and decided to incorporate it into Cam's story, which then entailed a year, a year and a half of research on the topic. I think it would have been very hard to relinquish Cam to anyone other than Desiree Akhavan. Uh, I felt very lucky that I knew her early work. I was a fan of her web series, The Slope. My wife got me into it way back in the day which means like six years ago, but still. I was a really big fan of her first film, Appropriate Behavior, and because she is a queer woman, um, and because I knew she knew the book ahead of time, and it wasn't just the idea that it was a sensational topic she could maybe make a film out of, I felt very comfortable giving uh, Cam's story over to her and to her amazing writing partner and co-producer, Cecilia Frugiwelle. So it was, it's been a wonderful collaboration the whole way through. I would probably take more credit than they would give me if they were here, but they're not here with me. So I'll say, no, I, they, they, they were really generous to me. I think there are a lot of, um, I think there are a lot of authors who have sort of horror stories about not having any say at all. And we Skyped a number of times, uh, early, early days. We emailed back and forth about their concepts for the book. I actually went to Montana with Desiree for a 48 hour sort of whirlwind trip when I was trying to show her all of Cam, the real life versions of Cam's locations uh, and trying to convince her to, to film there. And then I saw several drafts of the screenplay and actually gave about seven pages of notes on the first draft of the screenplay, most of which I'm sure they ignored and rolled their eyes at. But they were very, very inclusive of me and, and constantly had questions all the way up through the filming process. And then I was on set a couple of times uh, and I'm actually in the movie with my wife very, very briefly during the Christian rock concert scene. So if you look closely, you'll, you'll spot me. It's so funny to think of like my high school years as having a revival. That's just absurd to me. But uh, part of the reason that I wrote Cam's coming of age in the 90s is because that's when my queer coming of age was. It was, it was in the early 90s, so we can trace those paths together. Um, and I also, you know, it, it sounds maybe a little bit less absurd to say it in 2018. When I first started saying this in 2005, people laughed at me. But 
I, I thought even then that I was reclaiming a queer space in history and that I wanted to make sure that I, that I got down on the page what it was like to grow up rural and queer in the early 90s and that there was a space for that story, that I was carving out a space for that story. It was both because I was able to write some autobiographical elements into Cam's story, which I think helps make it pretty authentic, but also because I wanted to make sure that that experience of what that looked like coming of age queer in the 90s ended up in my story. Now that I've done the 1990s, uh, I'm really interested in the Gilded Age, turn of the century sort of Gilded Age uh, US, and that actually is the next book that I've written. It takes place uh, during very, very early 1900s, end of, the, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, and it was the, the period that most interested me, especially teasing out queer elements from that time. Okay, so the, the currently obsessed with, as in of the last 24 hours, is Rebecca, which I just bought here in London. Um, I'd read in college, hadn't read for years, and I felt like, oh, I have to buy Rebecca. I'm in London, I have to do it. And so I'm now maybe 30 pages in, and I'm like, oh my gosh, why, am not, why have I not been reading this book every year? It's amazing, and it's so spooky. It's the perfect book for fall. So for, you know, as, as of the last 24 hours, the answer is Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like an, uh, an unfair answer, but I think my answer is I don't have one. Um, I can do them from different eras. Ramona Quimby, age eight, would certainly be one. Uh, Matilda, Roald Dahl's Matilda, would be another, no question. Probably Scout from To Kill a Mockingbird would be another. I mean, I feel like I can do them from every era, but I, I don't have one all-time favorite fictional character. I feel like I should say Cam Post, but it, that's, it's untrue. She wouldn't be my favorite of all that I've read. So I love Truman Capote's infamously unfinished novel, Answered Prayers, and I think it would be very difficult to put that on screen, um, partly just because so much of it is based in reality, which is why he got so much in trouble with it, and because it's unfinished. But I think for both of those reasons, because it's so wickedly catty, um, and because it's so much based in reality, and because it would require a filmmaker to finish the story, I would love it if Answered Prayers made it to the big screen. There is a criminally unknown uh, memoir from 1901 by a then 19-year-old author named Mary McLean, uh, which she originally wanted to be published under the title, the brilliant title, I Await the Devil's Coming. Uh, but she's, you know, 19, she's in Montana, she sends this manuscript off to Chicago. They agree to publish it, which itself is remarkable, but unbeknownst to her, they changed the name to the very dull, The Story of Mary McLean. Despite the change in title, the book goes on to sell 100,000 copies in its first month. It's a sensation. It, a cocktail is named after Mary McLean. A baseball team is named after Mary McLean. And she's lifted up out of these very humble beginnings in Butte, Montana, and sent on a, on a, you know, a nationwide tour and becomes quite a sensation. Um, and the book, thankfully, is back in print under its original title, I Await the Devil's Coming, and it's just so remarkable and queer, especially for a book from 1901. I think that, I think of Mary McLean as kind of a long-lost fairy godmother to me as a queer Montanan, and I'm sad that I didn't know her as a teenager, and her book has very much influenced my new novel, which takes its name from the title of that, or from a, from a section in that book. Um, plain Bad Heroines, where Mary complains about how no one has ever written a novel about plain bad heroines and she wishes someone would do it. So uh, the girls in my novel are at a boarding school, they become obsessed with uh, I Await the Devil's Coming, they become obsessed with Mary McLean, and that very much happened in real life. So if I could convince everyone to go out and find this book and read it and marvel at how queer and strange and wonderful it is, um, if, if my book does that it'll be a success to me. My biggest tip is to keep at it because there are always going to be things that get in your way and I know that sounds like a really simple thing for people to say but so much of being a writer I think at any stage is failure and frustration and you know maybe loss of inspiration. If you're someone who needs inspiration to write you're probably in trouble. Um, so it's just to keep at it and to recognize that it's okay if it feels like work. Uh, sometimes it does feel like work and that's just part of the process. Um, I think the other thing that other writers have said better than I'm going to say right now, but that I think is really true, is that early on when you make work, 
One of the frustrations is that it's not as good as you want it to be. Your writing doesn't feel as good as you want it to be, and that's part of the process too. You have to keep writing and writing to get your writing to the place where it's good enough that it satisfies you. And if it never does, then you always have something you're writing toward. But I would really say keep writing, just to keep at it. Um, talent is really easy to come by. I see it all the time in my students, but that ability to, to get yourself at your computer or at your desk is much, much harder. So keep writing.